So, Professor Georg Nothoff is a philosopher, neuroscientist, and psychiatrist, holding degrees in all three disciplines. Originally, originally from Germany, he was recruited to head up the Mind, Brain, and Neuroethics Research Unit at the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research, affiliated with the University of Ottawa. Dovonotov researches the relationship between the brain and mind in its various facets, focusing on the neural and biochemical mechanisms related to higher order mental functions like consciousness and self in both healthy people and in those with such mental illnesses as depression and schizophrenia. The question drives me, driving me, he says, is why and how can our brain construct subjective phenomena like self, consciousness, and emotions? Professor Northhoff is one of the leading figures in linking philosophy, neuroscience, and is the author of, of 260 journal articles and 15 books, including Neurophilosophy and the Healthy Mind, Neuropsychoanalysis in Practice, and the spontaneous brain from the mind body to the world brain problem. Welcome, Professor Nordhoff. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever time zone. Oh, here you are. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you never know these days. Okay. Yeah, hello. Um, so I will, um, I will uh, do a slight presentation. So the format of the presentation is slightly different uh, because that's a, a different disciplinary milieu, but I hope since that we converge a lot. So let me uh, start sharing. Oh, you need to end. Yeah, I, I did, I did already. Okay, yes. And if you yeah. don't manage, then Matan has your presentation as well. So it's there, it's there. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Perfect. So let me make the whole thing large. Okay, there we are. Okay, yeah, you already heard uh, what I'm about. So you know everything about me. I could stop talking now. So the main question is really, um, how does neuronal activity transform into mental activity? And for that, I assume time to be of essence, literally. Time and space going back to the very basics of our natural world. So what we're currently confronted with in, I think, neuroscience, neuropsychoanalysis, psychoanalysis in general, we have a clear divide. We, oops, oops, sorry. We know very well here the surface. Yeah, that's of course the consciousness. And I think the deep insights of psychoanalysis, and that's why I'm very much drawn into it as a, let's say, neuroscientist, is that you try to go into the deeper layers of the mind. You all know this subconscious consciousness, you know the topography of self, and you know all that. I don't need to tell you about that. However, what we're doing in neuroscience is mainly here, scratching the surface, the cognitive approaches, maybe the embodied approaches are here. The question is, how do we get here? Because this one, here's a surface, is based on this one. So how and how can we get access here? And that's where the moment where I say time, space, dynamic coming in. And when I speak of dynamic, I mean in a very literal sense, change from time point to time point. That's the way I also understand psychodynamic. Yeah, from time point to time point. And that pattern of change is not random or arbitrary. So, um, and I think that, uh, of course, you all know the famous uh, article by Freud, 1895, Scientific Psychology, which uh, recently has sort of found an update in terms of more cognitive predictive coding, free energy terms by Mark Zorms. And I would simply say he had the right neuroscience. What? Uh, he didn't have, he didn't have cognitive neuroscience at his time, but I would say that even cognitive and affective neuroscience are steps in the right direction, but not sufficient. You need to be more radical. You need to go back to the very bottom basics of the brain and slash of the natural world, time and space. And I will tell you that, uh, how that uh, I bring that to life and uh, more flesh to the bones. So that's why we spoke in this very recent paper just with an Italian postdoc, a former postdoc of mine, uh, Andrea Scalabrini, uh, as a project for spatial temporal neuroscience. So 
So, and that's relevant for neuroscience, but also as to our view, highly relevant for psychoanalysis, neuropsychoanalysis. So I will, um, you know, time is limited as we all know. So I will briefly, very briefly go a little bit into the uh, theoretical model of Brian Selk. I will probably uh, go faster than I show you very briefly because this is very important for the, for the self, uh, topography and different layers of self. Remember what my comment was, we have different temple layers. And that's, that's actually, our self has different temple layers, and then you have different disorders like depression or anxiety, you have a dissociation between these layers, yeah? And that's probably really the key. So I will try to indicate that uh, in the 45 minutes I have available, um, and then Irit can tell me whether I stuck to time or not. Okay. Um, theoretical model, first part, and that's very important. What we are currently really confronting is a contingency. We have the brain, we have the psyche, but we don't really know how to connect. Yes, okay, we say, ah, oh, uh, the patient presented this and this, ah, oh, that may be related to that and that circuit, and that neural network. Yes, but the other question is, how is it possible that that neuronal activity of that neuronal network transforms into subjective experience, into the kind of symptoms and behavior you, for instance, uh, demonstrated so impressively in the case report. Yeah, so that's the question I'm coming in. That's uh, the contingency. Yeah, so there is no link, no glue where we say, ah, that provides the connection. It's like you have a big river, you have two parts, you have no bridge. You have no idea how to come to the other side. And I think that's still, despite our progress, which is unbelievable compared to 20, 30 years ago, we still don't have an idea of that condition. So that's why we speak of a gap of contingency. And for the philosophers of your cause, this is basically the hard problem version of that. So now I say that is in part due to a methodological mismatch. And I think one of the beauties of psychoanalysis, psychodynamics, is that you really consider the psyche in terms of dynamic and topographic terms. So it's not just one single isolated time point. You consider that single isolated time point in the context of all other time points. That's dynamic and the changes. And you saw that in the case, it's disrupted the link between time points. And you consider it in topographical terms, meaning you consider it in relative relation to each other, different layers. That's for me topography, and I think Freud, and others are beautiful examples of a mental topography or a mental dynamic. So now the question you want to have in the brain, how do you want to link that to the brain? Currently, what we do is this. We try to link the dynamic and topographical psychodynamic features to cognitive or affective features, which often are somewhat static, modular, and non-spatial temple. Uh, yeah, so for me, there's a methodological mismatch. Okay, we go from cognition to affect, which is already a major step and major progress, but we need to even go further down. And that's why I said, okay, maybe we need to view the brain in terms of dynamic and topographic terms. So we need to consider the single network in the context of the whole brain, just as in the mental topography. Yeah, we need to consider the single time point in the context of all time points, just like in psychodynamics. Yeah, you have the whole life story. You consider the current event as a symbolization, paradigmatic fascination of all the other time points, both in the past and the future anticipated time points. Yeah, that's for me dynamic. And that's what we try to do in my group with spatial temporal neuroscience. So we consider, and you will see this, the brain in terms of topography and dynamic, and we link that to corresponding mental topographies and dynamic topographies. And I will show you a little bit. So why do I emphasize so much on time and space? You can say not of is crazy, it probably is, but nevertheless, why? Because these are the basic fundamentals of nature. Here, Nikola Tesla, you know, uh, Google him, he's a very interesting guy in, in, in Wikipedia, very interesting uh, CV. Uh, an inventor at the end 19th, uh, 20th century. Um, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, vibration. You could say that if you want to seek, find the secrets of the self or consciousness, think in terms of energy, vibration. And I will show you data supporting that. 
So that's why we basically say, look, time and space are shared, are like the bridge between neuronal and psychological, psychodynamic processes. Yeah, it's like the bridge, you go from one side of the river to the other river. Yeah, and that connect and that makes it possible to consider, aha, uh -huh, these are just two parts of one country. Yeah, the same thing. We have this here in, in Ontario and Quebec, we have the big river right, right across. Yeah, so that's why we speak of common currency. And that common currency, I will show you now how neuronal topography translates into mental topography. Uh, neuronal dynamic translates into mental dynamic. So when I speak of, whoop, why doesn't it go? This is not nice. Yeah, OK, there we are. So when I speak of space and time, and that's important when you want to understand my view of the brain. So this slide is key because that's also the link to the mental side. So usually we consider the brain with operating within the outer time and space of the world. So, and we perceive that world. There are plenty of beautiful studies, neuronal correlates of our perception and cognition of time. That's basically, it's like a container view. The brain is uh, like a container within the time of the world. However, it actually it goes back to German philosopher Kant, Immanuel Kant, uh, 18th century. The mind, slash now in my case, the brain, has an inner time. It had its own time. Yeah. And time means here, and I will show you that in the next slide, it, it's an inner time. And the continuously matching indicated here between inner and outer time. And when that matching process breaks down, you see the kind of phenomena you just reported. So what do I mean by the brain's inner time? Again, very simple, nothing special. Go back to nature, look, I mean, here in Israel, you're beautiful, you have the sea waves, you have the Mediterranean, and it's probably warmer in your case than here, here it's minus 15. Uh, so next time I come in person and take a swim, it's a crazy German, <laughs> yeah. And so you have waves, you have big waves, you have small waves, yeah. And the big waves are very powerful. As a surfer, you want the big waves because they have power and they have temporal continuity. And the small waves are less dangerous, not as powerful, but fast. And that's exactly what you have in the brain. These are your raw data, you have different kinds of waves. Yeah? So meaning, these are all different fluctuations. These are times, these are different time scales. Fast time scales in gamma, very slow time scales in fMI, and we have even slower time scales. Yeah, the whole lifespan. These are all different time scales, and they're all, so I always like to say, like the Russian dolls, uh, that we, we hear that often from me, they're all nested with each other. Yeah? So that's basically indicated, and that you can investigate. So that's basically your neuronal dynamic. And I will show you that neuronal dynamic has a certain structure, and that structure is key for mental structure slash mental phenomena. So that's basically the idea, common currency, shared topography dynamic, and I think I spoke a lot. So now let me just give you uh, to the main topic that's sort of the background about, I, I'm not sure whether you can see this, uh, it's about the self dynamic and topography of the self. So what do I mean by self? I know there's a lot of discussion in psychoanalysis. When I speak of self, I mean a subjective view. So you see yourself in the mirror uh, you recognize yourself. Yes, there's a cognitive process, there's attention, working memory, blah, 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 going on. But even more, there's a feeling, there's a sense. Yeah, this is me. Yeah, and usually that sense is pre-conscious. It's not an explicit consciousness. It's pre-phenomenal, as I like to say. Yeah. Uh, and that's where you work as a psychotherapist, with those changes and that level. Yeah. So, and that experience I'm after, because I say that that experience, not even consciousness, experience in the basic sense, that is uh, characterized by space and time. So, uh, and what we did here, um, we did the self-research over many years already. Um, and the reason we, we put all kinds of studies together and did a very complex meta-analysis um, with a former a postdoc of mine who is now a professor in, in, in Guangzhou in China, Ping Ming Kim. Um, so, and what we did in these imaging studies, we put all kinds of imaging studies together and we found sort of these three distinct layers of self. 
So first, we said the regions for interceptive processing. So when you process, you become aware of your own heartbeat. When you have panic disorder, you have the feeling you have a heart attack, but heart is completely normal. It's your perception of the heartbeat, which is abnormal. That's, for instance, interceptive awareness. And you see typical regions for the experts among you. It's uh, bilateral insula, anterior cingulate cortex, uh, salamus. So it's really basic subcortical, cortical processing limbic system. Yeah, that's what it is, uh, the limbic system. Then when you come up one next layer, you get to the exoceptive proprioceptive forcing. So the outer body boundaries. Uh, when you, for instance, have the rubber hand illusion, or you have the feeling, oh, this, this, uh, this arm is sort of more outside. Uh, and so that involves regions like uh, bilateral uh, temporal parietal junction, premotor cortex, and anterior medial prefrontal cortex. And what is very interesting, it again involves exactly the regions here from the interceptive level. So the insula and the salamus all come up here again. That speaks, okay, it's like a nestedness. And then you go even more up layer, mental, when you think about ourselves, self-referential, that's a typical thing, what they do. Uh, you see a lot of the default mode network cortical midline structures. And again, you see all the other regions from the first two layers, you also see them in the third layer. What a surprise. So this is really a little Russian doll there in our head, apparently. So, and what you see, and this is not just interceptive processing. This is very important. The reviewers force us to speak of interceptive processing, but this is really interoceptive processing linked to the extraceptive input. Why is that important conceptually? Because that means that places your self, your inner self, your inner bodily self, right in the ecological context of your environment. An intro exoceptive, sort of a virtual intro extraceptive link there, integration. That's very important, uh, particularly for psychoanalysis. Yeah. And then you have exoceptive proprioceptive processing, the outer bound, uh, body boundaries relative to the outer world. And then you have the mental. And what you can see here, what we indicated here, I think this is uh, quite nice, uh, you see the nestedness. So the insula is recruited here, insula is again recruited here, and also nested, uh, uh, recruited here. TPJ, temporal parietal junction, anterior medial prefrontal cortex, premotor cortex are also recruited here, plus additional region. So this is really like the Russian dots. Yeah, and that had huge implication, meaning the information from here is somewhat latently present here but it's put into a different context. And I will tell you that's a different temporal context. Yeah, so there is a certain self-similarity and I think this goes very well with the kind of phenomena uh, we explain. And uh, it's not only the Russians who produce this nestedness, it's also the Chinese. Look at this crystal ball. These are, I don't know how many crystal balls are in there. It's unbelievable, yeah. So the world record for the Russian dolls is 51. I think this is many more. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, yeah, so in that exactly, and when this nestedness is break, broken down, then you get symptoms, and I will show you. So now, okay, this is uh, clear. You can, of course, if you want to put this into psych more psychodynamic context, uh, interceptive cells might be more related to the, to the eat because it's sort of pre-phenomenal, but it's not by definition unconscious. I would say that your gradient of conscious unconscious basically operates across these three. If the boundaries of this one become more extended, then your consciousness, you have also more consciousness of, of your interceptive self. So meaning consciousness versus non or unconsciousness of your eat is a relative issue, depending upon these uh, boundaries. And you will see these boundaries can be shifted. And so that, of course, but I leave that to you. I leave that uh, for the discussion whether you want to have these three layers of cell associated with the three, uh, with the topography of Freud. Um, how about the dynamic of systems? So here, I already showed that to you, the time series raw data from the uh, brain. You see here the uh, uh, different waves. Uh, and what is important, these different waves, I think I already said that before that we have uh, much more power in the slower frequencies here, here's power, here's frequency, much more power in the slower frequency, meaning the slower waves have much more energy. And power. Yeah, that's basic principle of nature, the brain is not different. And then you can also analyze the different time scales, shorter and longer, and here you see the sort of nestedness 
of the time scales. Again, you already know what I will say here. So in these kind of shapes, you can measure. And now the question is, is this kind of hierarchy, are these kind of shapes, uh, power spectra related to your sense of self? And that's exactly what it is. It is not just the power in one frequency, but it's a relative balance between the powers of the different frequencies. That's what you can see here. You see here the frequency here, you see the power. And you see the more power you have, uh, you have more power in the slower ones and less power in the faster ones. Each line, interestingly, is one subject. So you see huge inter-individual variability that strongly speaks for the fact and the observation in which we did in separate papers and others too, that the shape of this curve is highly sensitive to traumatic life events. Yeah. So there is a direct ecological environmental connection. And on the other hand, there's a connection to the self. Here we measured the degree of self-consciousness, particular private self-consciousness. Then you can see the steeper your curve, the more power you have in your slower frequencies, the higher your self-consciousness. So meaning your long, powerful, slow waves are very important for your self-consciousness. So here you can already see, and we did this in both fMRI and, 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 and EEG, uh, that you can really see a direct relationship between the different time scales of the brain, the shape, the relative relation between the different time scales of the brain and to your self-consciousness. So and it's not yourself, it's not just one time scale, it's a multiple of different time scales and how they are related to each other, slow and fast, long and short. Um, yeah, I leave that out and I always uh, uh, show this particular, uh, always like this. So what does our self do? Um, look at this, this painting. I'm a big fan of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Because what, look what first he, he creates is a 2D canvas, but he creates the illusion as if this is a 3D room. Yeah, you see the depths of the room literally, of course, you know all this. This is the Last Supper uh, in Milano. Um, and you see the depths of the room, he creates the illusion of a 3D room. Yeah, it's unbelievable how they do this, this Renaissance painting. And then also, particularly important, you have the feeling this is just a snapshot. If you were looking a millisecond later, these guys, the apostles, obviously, uh, that they would take on a different gesture. Yeah, so he creates a virtual dynamic. That's what yourself is about. It's a virtual dynamic. It's a virtual 3D topography. That's why I always present this picture. So now, now you say, yeah, not of this is all nice and dandy and this is basic neuroscience. I'm absolutely not interested as a clinician. However, I would say you ought to be because now I show you that the changes in these topographic dynamic features very briefly indicated in depression and anxiety. And I would say that is huge implications, as Rosa indicated, for psychotherapies, because ultimately you want to work with spatial temporal features in your psychotherapy. Okay, you all know this uh, depression, I don't need to tell you, you have these ruminating thoughts, circulating repetitive thoughts associated with negative emotions, and you just cannot get out of this circular thought. So, and usually these thoughts, as you all know, they're very much focused on the own self with negative emotions. Am I guilty? I'm wrong. I did this wrong. I'm a failure. And, but it's all about the own ego. So complete social withdrawal, disconnect. In particular, they don't feel the environment. They lose this tacit, implicit, pre-phenomenal, whatever you want to say, feeling of their relationship to others and the environment. But you know all this. So that's why we speak of Sorry, increased self focus, decreased thought focus. So, here I show you uh, uh, one example, for instance, for the three layers of self. So, what do we show? You see that in the, uh, you remember that the mental self was the uh, default mode network. So, this is a study by uh, Andreas Calabrini, the said, uh, former postdoc of mine, who's now in, in Milano, Bergamo. And we continue working together. And he's also a psychoanalyst and neuroscientist. So he showed that in the acute depressed state, you really have abnormal concentration of all activity in your default mode network. Yeah. So your brain's global activity is just everything is focused on the default mode network. 
Yeah, and that's what you can see here. It's basically too much for the expert. I'm going to use this as a global signal correlation. And I think I always like to show this. So this is, of course, you all know what this is, is, is climate, uh, climate change. And you see it's basically one basic uh, climate change, let's say the ozone layer, but it has different manifestations in different parts of the world. So same here that in the case of the global brain activity, it has different degrees in different regions of the brain. And what you see in, in depression that you see a too strong manifestation of this global brain activity in the DMA. So all the resources are shifted towards the DMA. And as we all know, nothing comes for free. Meaning if you shift everything towards the DMA, then it is shifted away somewhere else. And that's your sensory regions. And that's the sensory regions which you need to connect to your external environmental world. Yeah, and we have a whole line of studies where we investigate the occipital cortex, visual perception, that these patients are too slow in their visual perception. And then, of course, if you have the feeling that everything is too fast, of course you withdraw. It's very normal, completely normal reaction. Yeah. So here in this figure, what you also showed is quite nice, uh, that really the, the DMN is too strongly correlated with the non-DMN, with the periphery regions, with the sensory regions. So what does that mean? So all your incoming sensory inputs you perceive in terms of yourself. And that's exactly what you see in depression. Yeah, Everything is focused on the self. Yeah? And Andreas Calabrini, I always like that. He speaks of the DMN like a magnet. Yeah, the, It's too strong in depression. Yeah? So uh, here I show you also some uh, temple stuff uh, that the people are simply too slow. Uh, you can see this uh, here. It's called median frequency. They're too slow. They have too much power in the slower frequencies and not enough in the faster one. Particular where? In occipital cortex. Why? Because then if your occipital cortex is too slow, you cannot follow the fast movement of my hand. And then you wonder, why does Nortov speak with the hand? He tried to embellish his meaning, but I don't get the link between his hand movement and the meaning. I don't understand Nortov. I withdraw and I'm frustrated. I'm too stupid to follow yeah, or maybe it's also due to me because I don't explain things well. Yeah, but that's probably what happens when you're too slow. Um, so what does this mean now for the three-layer topography of self? That your mental self is abnormally inflated. It's too strong. And that's, I think, I indicate that, that here, that's the extension of the blue stuff. Whereas your extraceptive to get here, your outer body where is too small. You feel locked into your body, yeah? Your spatial extent and, uh, and everything is too slow. Yeah, so you see a disbalance, an abnormal increase in mental self and probably a decrease in the proper response. So here, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, you still say, yeah, not of all nice and good, but I don't believe you that time has an impact on psychological measures. So here we did a purely psychological study and we looked for trauma. So we applied the childhood traumatic questionnaire, which is a valid established questionnaire for traumatic events in childhood and ran that in uh, uh, 100 depressed patients and 100 healthy patients. And we also, a uh, healthy subject, and we also included um, the Zimbardo time perspective inventory. This is a questionnaire for past and future events. And you can see the uh, scale results here. So we show here is the BDI, back depression, uh, back hopelessness scale, BHS, BDI. Of course, the depressed people had much more. Uh, and then you see the CTQ, uh, Childhood Traumatic Questionnaire. And you can see the blue ones as the depressed. You see much more trauma in these patients, which is well known. And you also see the kind of trauma, which by itself is interesting, mainly emotional abuse and emotional neglect. Not so much physical abuse, uh, social neglect and uh, physical neglect, Yeah, which I think is by itself interesting because that emotional neglect and abuse provides a direct link to the kind of symptoms in depression. Yeah. Uh, then you see here the Zimbardo invites, the Zimbardo, uh, the time perspective has different uh, uh, dimensions, present, past, future, and so on. And of course, no surprise, more past, less future. In the 
So now, but the interesting thing is now, how does the abnormal time perspective stands in relation to this one, to the trauma and the depression? So here, and you can calculate that with what is called a mediation model. So here the question is, is the time perspective mediating the impact from the trauma on the depressive symptoms? Or are the depressive symptoms mediating the impact of trauma on time perspective? Because this is important. Is time just a cognitive thing, an outflow dependent upon your severity, depression severity, or is it a mediating factor from trauma to depressive? So when you see for the experts, this is a full mediation, this is no mediation at all. Uh, so meaning when you take out the time perspective, this relationship is no longer significant. And for me, this was very interesting because even on the psychological level, time mediated the impact of trauma on depression. Yeah, so this is very, very important. You can have trauma, but your time perspective is normal. You will not have depressive symptoms. That's what it means. Yeah, so this is very, very important. So meaning psychotherapeutically, you might want to work with this one to improve this. Yeah, and then probably you also get a handle of this. Yeah, and I think much what you do in psychoanalysis is basically temple therapy. You try to integrate different timescales of your biography and try to integrate and nest them with each other so that you have access to it and can re-experience that integration. So um, here, I think I will probably leave that out and uh, for the sake of time, this is bipolar. Uh, I leave that out and I'll show you the last example of uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, topography and dynamic of the self and anxiety. Uh, disorders, you all know this, of course, uh, Edward Munch, uh, uh, you become anxious. So what happens when your uh, slow waves become unstable? You become anxious. And that's what you see. Probably I discussed it a lot uh, with, with a student of mine in, uh, in Italy. Uh, he is an expert in anxiety disorder, and he always says that you, you, they have a lack of temporal continuity. Suddenly, yeah, they have they lack certain time points in their subjective experience, and and then they get, and then of course that introduces uncertainty when you cannot link the different time points. You have a lack thereof, and then suddenly you have a gap, and that of course anxiety. Boom. Um, and what we observed, this was very interesting. So this is a study we, 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 we did in China. Um, so we tested for your awareness of your inner self. Interceptive awareness, this was heartbeat awareness. Yeah, and you know that in, in uh, generalized anxiety disorder, and also particularly in panic and social anxiety too, you have an abnormal awareness of your interceptive functions. And that's what you can uh, uh, see here and what we observe in these patients. So here's the, uh, the, the, the darker ones are the, are the patients in uh, generalized anxiety, the other ones are the healthy subject. And that you see in response when they have to become a, uh, aware of their own heartbeat, they show abnormal hyperactivity, meaning their interceptive regions, limbic regions, they react too strongly. And if your neuronal activity reacts too strongly, you perceive it accordingly. And if you perceive it so strong, then you get anxious that you cannot control the whole thing. And I think that's exactly what is the case. So you can see this here for left and right insula, I show abnormal hyperactivity. And then interestingly, this was also correlated, the uh, insular activity was also correlated with the awareness of your own, this is a, a body perception question, okay? uh, with the awareness of your own uh, body. And of course, uh, the more awareness you are, the more perceive your usually pre or unconscious interceptive processing. Now you perceive it conscious because the activity is too strong. Yeah, so the gradient of conscious, unconscious, pre-phenomenal, phenomenal can shift depending upon the context in which it acts. Yeah, and then we also show the relationship to the, uh, um, uh, the thought mode network. So that is important uh, for here. Uh, we also go more into details. This is a very recent paper where we show that functional connectivity is also desynchronized. 
Yeah, in these patients, you have a desynchronization of your different regions, particularly here of the default mode network. Uh, and that has huge complications because if these regions no longer synchronize with each other, your mental self also becomes unstable. Yeah. Uh, if you cannot synchronize with me through these movements and my talking, you will not understand what I try to convey with these movements. And then you say, what is this not of talking about? Then you become insecure and maybe anxious at some point. Yeah. So this is another uh, meta-analysis of uh, data. You can see clearly that in the default mode, uh, the default mode network is highly desynchronized. Decreased functional connectivity in the resting state, the meta-analysis we just published last year. So you have an unstable mental self. And I think that's very typical. You see this in panic disorder, you see this in GAD and also in and social anxiety, particularly social anxiety. The other person comes and you become unstable, you become anxious. Yeah, it's a beautiful example of the key role of the relational component. So, I, and then this decreased functional connectivity in the resting state leads to abnormal hyper response of these regions when exposed to external stimuli. That's exactly what you see in the symptoms. So, what does this mean for the self? You see that your very slow waves in your default mode network are desynchronized. Yeah. So meaning your mental self becomes weaker, becomes unstable. And as a compensation, probably you abnormally increase your particular interceptive awareness and your extraceptive awareness. Yeah. So increase the other layers. So you have again a disbalance between the different Russian dots slash self, both topographic and neural terms. So basically what you need, so one Russian doll is abnormally small, it can barely be seen, the other ones become relatively bigger. And then of course your mental self becomes anxious because it completely disappears. Yeah. So conclusion. Um, I hope that I indicated my starting point was how does brain activity transform into mental activity? Uh, how can we make a bridge? What do they share? And I said, okay, there's still a gap of contingency. Uh, and um, Freud, as far as I read that paper, he really located his project for psycho scientific psychology up here. Uh, recently, Mark Zorn's tried to establish a new project for scientific psychology, goes into free energy, predictive coding, it's an excellent paper. Uh, but somehow, it still leaves open, how can we close this gap? Yeah. So, and that's then the idea, okay, we look for topography, not only on the mental side, but also on the neuronal side. We look for structure on the uh, mental side, and we might also want to look for structure on the neuronal side. Remember the structure of the power, the, the, the power of fast slow, the steepness of the curve. We want to look for dynamic on this uh, mental side, and we also want to look for dynamic on the neuronal side. So that's basically the idea of the common currency approach. And I already showed that uh, to you. And what is important that we then, so what we're currently doing is this. We have a gap here. Yeah, we have the brain here, we have the gap, and then we say, okay, this circuit is mapped to this one. But we don't really know how to connect. It's a gap of contingency, as I say. So, and I would say, look, we need to conceive the brain and the mental features in terms of topography and dynamics, space and time, brain dynamics. Yeah, so brain dynamics, brain topography are key, and then translated into mental topography. And that explains us consciousness, self, and also. Uh, other the changes, as I indicated, in psychiatric disorders. So basically, I would strongly advocate, and you already guessed that, of course, of course, that I say, okay, we need to link the dynamic and topography of psychoanalysis to the dynamic and topography of the brain and its environmental context. Plus, then also, and this is one of the most exciting lines of research we're currently trying to put, we also try to look for the fluctuations in your subjective experience. So we look for the dynamic of your subjective experience. 
Yeah, so we have time series. So it's like the waves. You stand at the ocean and look at the waves. They're continuously changing, and you see a certain pattern in there. And that's what we do also with the fluctuations, for instance, in our sense of self or our thoughts. And that's what I say. Uh, maybe we really need a project for spatial temporal neuroscience. I would say that will unravel the different, remember, the different layers that these are temporal spatial layers. And I think Rosa did a fantastic job in linking, showing these different spatial temporal layers uh, in her talk and also in our book. That's why we really nicely converged. And I do think that it's huge psychotherapeutic implication because you want to have sort of a layer specific uh, a psychotherapy. Yeah. So what's that layer relative to the other layer? That's where you have to work on. And I think tacitly, you probably do that already to a certain degree. Yeah. So, and then basically, uh, this is by a uh, figure that comes from uh, Andreas Calabrini, this beautiful figure. Uh, it's the end of our recent uh, paper, their project for special temporal neuroscience. And basically, it works. This is so we here try to sketch the first time for the special temporal therapeutic context. So, what do we have? We have different time scales. Yeah, we have different topographic scales, larger uh, spatial scales, more spatially extended, the mental self interceptive, less spatially extended. Uh, smaller range of time scales larger range of time, whoops, sorry, it's too early, larger range of time scales. So here you have a lot of slow, continuous time scale. Here it's very fast, very boom, 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 yeah? So, and that's important. And the degree to which these different time scales are integrated, that probably suggests how you experience your mental uh, bodily and inner body interceptors. However, these time scales do not operate in a vacuum. They operate in an environmental context, and in the psychotherapeutic context, it is a context between uh, the patient and the therapist. So what do you do? You match your time scales. And that I see, I think what you do when you sense, okay, there is this, there's an emotional knot there, there is trauma, something goes on and you sense it. I'm sure this is where you match some of your time scales uh, with the time scales probably related to the trauma of your client. Yeah, and there you see a mismatch. And now, and Andrea Scalabrini then came up basically, this is a br I think it's a brilliant idea that basically you as a therapist, you use your time scale and basically in a virtual way, transfer it to your client that she or he can make use of a time scale which was traumatically disrupted. And by that you give the client the chance basically to add integrate the missing Russian doll or temple doll she or he has, yeah? And of course, I hope that also brain diagnostic can help in that because we look a lot of time scales, we develop psychological tests for time scales. It's all about time, except that I'm never in time, as you know. Uh, so that is really, and I think that's what we do. And of course, the same probably applies to space, but which is much more difficult to conceptualize. And that basically what he says is the matching, a stochastic matching between the time scale of the therapist uh, is a sensing. It's an active sensing. It's not sensory. It's an active temple. It's a sixth sense, a temple sensing. Yeah, you feel something is going on. Yeah, uh, that's basically it. And with that, I come uh, to the end. Uh, and again, thanks for the invitation and also thanks, Rosa, for the wonderful collaboration on this book. And I'm happy to see all the Israeli people again as we had <laughs> several sessions last time. I wish you everyone best. Thanks. Uh, th thank you, Gerold. Thank you for an amazing lecture. Another one. I suppose I wonder how much of your lecture did I understand, but I understand the overall thing and I have some things to tell you as you know we we're talking about imitation in the past so I hope we'll have another chance to talk uh, here on the uh, on the in this meeting we have 25 people from 25 countries okay. so uh, some are Israelis but most of them are from all over the world yeah. so uh, I'm, I'm very you... to see that in our crazy times. <laughs> exactly, 
exactly. This is what we were talking about. So we are going to go into a break. I suppose people need a small break.